the same fight or flight system that's going off if there was real danger, if you were in the mountains and there was a bear coming towards you. So that the panic attack itself is just going to run its course. It's just that you don't need that energy to fight or flee a bear. So instead, you have all these physical symptoms going on that you don't really need, and it creates these temporary and unpleasant kind of physical sensations that will go away. Hey guys, I'm Ashley Dawn Rivard, and you are now Into the Dawn, a provocative podcast that looks at all things taboo, such as suicide, grief, sex, addictions, and more. Each week, I talk with experts who successfully investigate their areas of interest. And if you like what you hear, please remember to subscribe. Dr. Kate Walitsky-Taylor is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at UCLA. She is a clinical psychologist with nearly 20 years of expertise in anxiety and related disorders. She has been funded by the National Institutes of Health continuously since her graduate career and is currently the principal investigator for several studies in which she is developing and evaluating behavioral treatments for co-occurring anxiety and substance use disorders. What is anxiety and how does it develop? How does it present itself? I'm sure it presents itself in many different forms, but from a medical standpoint. Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it's important to remember that anxiety is a normal, natural human emotion. Like we all feel anxious from time to time. Um, And what anxiety is, it's basically just what we consider a negative emotion that's usually future oriented um, and it's designed to prepare us for threat or danger. So it's associated with this apprehension about the future and worry about something bad that might happen. Um, When it becomes something that we get concerned about, right, like someone who might seek help for an anxiety problem, that's usually when it's starting to be um, excessive or out of proportion to the situation. So someone who's really anxious about something where there's no real danger, such as, you know, speaking up in class or at a meeting at at, uh, work or going to the grocery store or something like that, where it's kind of out of proportion to the situation. It's, it's frequently happening and it's starting to get in the way of someone's life. So it's causing distress and it's causing impairment in their life. So when we think of like an anxiety disorder, that's kind of where that normal human emotion of just kind of feeling worried or tense or thinking things, um, might go wrong in the future starts to get to the point where um, we might want to to have someone get some help. So that's kind of anxiety. And then um, fear is the kind of the the more intense kind of form of that that we feel when we think there's like imminent danger, right? So if I'm worried about um, driving on the freeway, I might be anxious thinking about it the day before, and then when I'm actually driving on the freeway, and maybe it's even more crowded than I thought, and someone cuts me off, then I might experience fear. And that's that more immediate kind of rush of um, more intense anxiety. But you must have fear to have anxiety, correct? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, they're both, they're both kind of human emotions, right? So fear also keeps us from danger. So like if I'm walking down the street and someone like holds a gun up to my head, then that fear response is, is what's kind of kicking my fight or flight system, right? It's telling me to get out of the way. Um, so I just think about it more in terms of like time, right? So anxiety is more like I'm worried about something happening in the future, And then fear is like the intense experience of anxiety in the moment when that, when I think that bad thing is happening, it might be a real bad thing. Like there might be real danger, like in the example of someone holding a gun to my head, or it might be perceived danger. Like, um, if I have to give this, I'm giving this speech right now in front of a big group, everyone's going to laugh at me. Uh, I might feel that same fight or flight response, but then it's kind of like a false alarm going off, right? Like we want our true alarms going off when there's real danger. But in the case of something like an anxiety disorder, sometimes these false alarms go off when there's no real danger. But then how does that come about? Is it a neurological 
issue that if you're just every day, like, you know, there's people um, who are just always anxious, like, you know, like, no, don't, don't do that. You might get hurt. You know, like, is, would you call that an intrusive thought when you always think something bad is going to happen? Yeah. So I think you're asking two really good questions. The first one about like how this comes about um, is a really complex question to answer. And I think the answer is we kind of know, but we don't have all of the puzzle pieces put together. What we do know is that there's some genetic predisposition, right? So there's about a 30% heritability of being prone to having an anxiety disorder. And that doesn't mean like if my parents have some kind of this particular anxiety disorder, I'm more likely to have that particular anxiety disorder. It's just a more general predisposition um, to having certain traits that make us more likely to develop an anxiety disorder. And then that leaves 70% of all sorts of other things from our environment, our learning. Environment could be anything from like the messages you were getting from your mom that the world is a dangerous place to experiencing a traumatic event um, as a young adult. Um, so there are a lot of different kinds of experiences that shape who we are and how we see the world and our future um, and how we kind of perceive the level of threat and danger that's around us. Mm -hmm. And so PTSD, I know a lot of people have, they're not even aware of these events, right? That have happened prior or you are because we are living in a crazy world right now, right? That you could have PTSD easily. If you have that, does that mean you have anxiety um, or depression? Are they similar? Are they... I know they're not the same thing, but how closely tied are those two together? Like, how do we know if we're depressed? How do we know if we're anxious? Yeah. So I think um, to answer the first part of your question, PTSD has a lot of, um, like if someone who actually has a diagnosis of PTSD, there is a lot of anxiety involved and there are other emotions involved as well too. Um, and usually there can sometimes be symptoms like anger or depression that go along with that. So I would say the simplest way to think about the difference between anxiety and depression is that with anxiety, usually what we're seeing is that a person has a lot of fear of something and we can kind of go into details of what those different things might be. And they're avoiding that thing, whatever it is, because of their fear. Um, they may be having panic attacks and being really worried about what's going to happen if they have another panic attack. Um, and it kind of depends. There's a variety of different anxiety disorders, but there's fear and anxiety and avoidance are like the main kinds of things going on. With depression, we think about it more as low mood, sadness, losing interest or pleasure in the things that people usually enjoy. So a lot of times they go hand in hand, right? You can imagine that if you're feeling really anxious and you start avoiding a lot of things, you may become socially withdrawn. You're not having a lot of positively rewarding experiences in your life. And so that can start to make you feel depressed. Um, so it, it makes sense that a lot of people with anxiety also have depression. But I think the main difference is that with anxiety, there's... Um, like can be worry, nervousness, tension, panic, these kinds of fears that something bad will happen. Whereas with depression, it's really characterized by low mood. Uh, we see things like trouble with sleeping and eating, um, fatigue, some kinds of things like that. Do you think from um, a therapist's standpoint, it is a dangerous, like a fine line we're walking if we tell ourselves I'm an anxious person versus I have moments of anxiety, but you know, when we, we self-diagnose mm -hmm. or if you go and get diagnosed, I mean, how conscious do we want to be of where we go with what we're telling ourselves about our anxiety? Really great question. And I think it depends on like, if you say I'm an anxious person, are you saying it in a way that motivates you to want to get help because you think that's a temporary way of defining yourself. Like I'm anxious, but I recognize that there are things I can do to feel less anxious. 
versus other people sometimes view it almost like part of their identity. Like, um, I'm an anxious person and that's just who I am. I'm owning it and there's nothing I can do about it. And so I don't think it's helpful to kind of put yourself in that camp because first of all, I don't think it's true. I think um, there are plenty of um, solutions for, for reducing anxiety. And I think if you start to believe that in this kind of global and stable way, um, it's going to probably make it harder for you to feel motivated to make those changes. And it can be, it's understandable why someone would say that if they've been feeling that way their whole lives and maybe haven't gotten the help that they need. Um, but when I see uh, patients and they say things to me like, well, I'm just a depressed person or I'm an anxious person. This is who I am. Um, anecdotally, I just find it like a little bit harder to motivate them to start thinking flexibly about who else they could be. So I think your first example where you said like, well, I'm anxious from time to time. I think that's a much more accurate way. Well, unless someone's anxious all the time, but then they might even say I'm anxious all the time, but that's not who I am as a person. So I think it depends on like how, much they're associating that with who they are and their identity. So would you say then that um, if one has been experiencing that they know themselves to be anxious all the time or easily triggered to be anxious, right? They, that's been their identity. Would you say that they can completely cure themselves of anxiety or once anxious, always anxious? I think it is definitely possible. We know, I shouldn't say I think, I know from the literature and from my own um, clinical experience that you can absolutely go from being anxious to no longer being anxious. So we have really effective treatments. Um, and I sometimes sort of say a little tongue in cheek to my patients, if you had to have a psychiatric problem or a mental health problem, this is the one to have because we mm -hmm. actually have really good ways of helping you. Other problems, admittedly, we don't have as great ways to help you. So um, for like a really simple example, like a specific phobia, like someone who has a fear of like insects or heights or something like that, we can absolutely cure that relatively quickly and in a pretty straightforward way. And then that person may never be afraid of that thing again. Hmm. It's a little bit more complex when we look at the response rates for people who have um, Things like generalized anxiety disorder, which is characterized by excessive and uncontrollable worry about daily life problems, or when we have a person who maybe has more than one anxiety disorder, we can often, response rates, if you look in the literature, um, are upwards of like between 70 to 90% success rate. But what we don't have is like, well, what happens to them 10 years later or 20 years later, right? We don't have these really long-term follow-ups. So we might go out a year or two and we can see that, yes, people are continuing to maintain their gains. They've learned a lot in treatment. Their anxiety is significantly reduced. And remember, we don't want anxiety to be zero. We don't want to get rid of someone's anxiety altogether. Anxiety is an important human emotion. We all, all need to feel some anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, when it's warranted, but that excessive and, un and uncontrollable kind of levels of anxiety that are really getting in the way of a person's life can absolutely be addressed in treatment. At these certain times, especially with, you know, the pandemic right now and what everyone's facing, I'm sure you see a surge of people you speak with, right? Like if you haven't felt anxiety at this time, then I don't know <laughs> what's going on with you. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, you you might have tools, but there is such this, our safety in some way is being challenged, right? Mm -hmm. What do you tell people? What should we do if we're just feeling this low grade of anxiety based on our safety right now and what the state of the world is? And we don't have a therapist. Put in our backpack. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I'm sure a lot of people are wondering because I, like you said, our safety is being kind of called into question, right? So it kind of goes back to the function of anxiety as a way of preparing us and for danger um, and telling us don't do that, that's dangerous. And in, in a real dangerous situation, it's a good thing that we're avoiding danger. And then in these other situations where there's no real threat, 
um, it's not good to avoid it because it prevents us from learning that the thing we're afraid of happening either isn't going to happen or it's not going to be that big of a deal. But here we are in this uncharted territory where it's sort of a little bit of in between, right? Like there are calculated risks, um, but this is a this is a disease that we know very little about. This virus. Um, we're learning more all the time. And so there's this element of having to tolerate the uncertainty of not being able to calculate these risks. And interestingly, that's one of the skills, like if someone came to my clinic who had a bona fide anxiety disorder pre-pandemic, one of the skills that I might teach them is how to take a look at the thing they're worried about happening and use really like logical evidence-based thinking to look at like, well, what are really the odds that this is gonna happen to you? And how bad would it really be if it happened to you? And learning like new, more flexible ways of thinking more realistically. That's tricky to do here because I'm not gonna try to convince someone that they're not at risk when I don't really know. Um, at the same time, there can be a lot of unhelpful behaviors that people might be engaging in that are just fueling their anxiety in an unnecessary way. So my, suggestion would be a couple of things. Um, and this, like you said, is for kind of run of the mill, low level anxiety that's been sort of triggered by what's going on. Um, one of the nice kind of things that I think you can do is turn off the news. I mean, after a half an hour of watching the news, you kind of have a sense of what's going on. I think watching a half an hour of news versus four hours of news is not going to teach you anything significantly different about what you should be doing to stay safe or what is happening in your community. All it's doing is just kind of fueling that anxiety. And it's also preventing you from engaging in other activities that may bring you a sense of joy or accomplishment or relaxation. So it's not only like a time suck, but it's also like a joy suck, right? It's just taking mm -hmm. everything out. Like we have so, we're stuck in our homes. There's very little we can really do. So watching the news and just kind of dwelling on how terrible things are is unhelpful. And I would recommend no more than like a half an hour a day of news. Um, unless you kind of check in with yourself and you notice that like, yeah, I'm actually learning something and it's interesting and it's not affecting my mood, then maybe fine. Um, but for the average person, I don't think it's that helpful. That would be one thing. Um, another um, would be getting some exercise. Just It just kind of goes back to basics. Social mm -hmm. connection, like we're all socially distanced. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. we have to be socially isolated because that's not good for anxiety or depression. Um, so just finding any ways you can connect with other people. Um, and I would say following CDC guidelines um, and not going overboard with um, kind of worrying about risks. So what I mean by that is I've had a lot of patients who um, maybe were kind of avoidant of going out in public anyway for other reasons that had to do more with like an anxiety disorder. And now that's kind of being normalized and actually encouraged um, and so they're like not going anywhere. Whereas like taking a walk around the block with a mask on has a lot of health benefits and mood lifting benefits or going to the grocery store occasionally with hand sanitizer and a mask. So not kind of, um, you don't want to tip the scale so far into like the worry and fear that you're, that you're not kind of giving yourself the chance to see that. I'm not, I'm probably not going to catch COVID from walking to taking a walk around the block with my dog with a mask on mm -hmm. at like a mm -hmm. time when there's not a lot of people. And again, it's so hard for someone like me to say, oh, go do all these things because we don't really know. And so I think another part of this is learning to tolerate uncertainty and learning to sit with that discomfort and that distress. And that might mean practicing some mindfulness techniques um, relaxation strategies, things that kind of just bring you into the present moment and let you kind of notice how you're feeling and thinking and just let it be without trying to push it away or judge it. You know, those those times when you get anxious or you're like, oh gosh, I'm feeling that feeling, but you have enough awareness to know you're feeling the feeling to catch it, right? You might pick up the phone to call somebody or 
you know, whatever activity you need to do to ground yourself. But then there's those times that you're already down the rabbit hole, okay? Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Because it's so visceral, right? So like your body, you almost feel maybe, I don't want to, I don't want to generalize me, people I know. uh, It's almost this feeling of like, you feel like you're going to die. And it could just be, let's take the COVID pandemic out of it. Uh, I think something that a lot of people can relate to um, is relationships, dating, then what? How do you get yourself out of that without going to, let's say, a toxic coping skill? How do we get out of the rabbit hole? And then why do we always go to that I, I'm going to pick up a drink or I'm going to call somebody who's not for my highest good, right? Yeah. What What is that? How do? What can we do in that moment to start? So do you mean like it? the rabbit hole of like negative thoughts, these like intrusive thoughts you're talking about? Or do you mean more of like a rabbit hole of like a panic attack? Like where you're feeling like this sudden rush of all these physical symptoms, like heart racing and trouble breathing and sweating. But- could they be similar? Could they be the same thing? Because um, I personally, I guess I'll just speak for myself. When I have negative thoughts and I'm going down this rabbit hole of negativity, I viscerally am having feelings yeah. of I'm out of body almost. Okay. You know? You so they must be one of the same, right? This activates this and i Yeah, Yeah. I would say the first thing leads to the other in the case you're describing. So I can tell you a couple of thoughts about this. Um, And thank you. That was helpful to clarify. And I think what you're (laughs) describing is actually like fairly common, this sort of chain from something happens, I get in my head about it, and I'm starting to worry, which it would be kind of the future oriented getting in my head, or I start to ruminate which would be the like, why did I do that? Or why did he or she say that? Or what does that mean? And what's wrong with me? And kind of playing this out, that would be more like rumination. They're both these kinds of um, repetitive and unhelpful thinking patterns that contribute to us feeling anxious or depressed. And particularly in the the worry one, the future oriented one, but could be with both, it can lead to this like, the, the kind of physical sensations of anxiety, because that's kind of like the thinking part of anxiety, the cognitive part, um, are all the things that you're telling yourself when you go down that rabbit hole. And then as a consequence of that, we often start to feel this physiological arousal. So heart racing, and um, like you said, almost like an out of body experience. So these dissociative experiences or rapid breathing or dizziness. Um, Because it's our physical part of anxiety telling us there's alarm because our thoughts have been telling us something bad is happening or something bad is going to happen. And our body's kind of response to that is to gear up to prepare for threat. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. So it's kind of like that anxiety is that negative emotion, that worry, that tension. And the thinking part is saying all these bad things are going to happen or have happened and it's going to be awful and you start to catastrophize and blow things out of proportion. And then your body gears up for, for fight or flight. And that's when that panic attack might happen. So it's almost like you've worried yourself into a panic attack in this situation. So to answer your question then, what do you do? Well, I think first you said a lot of times we can notice it before it gets that bad, right? And I would say the more that a person, and sometimes it takes therapy to do this, and sometimes people can figure this out on their own, but the more that people can start to catch it before it gets down the rabbit hole, the easier it's going to be to get out. So if you're able to kind of what we do, what we call it is self-monitoring. So if you're able to monitor Oh, I'm starting to feel anxious. What is the thought that's going through my head? Oh, the thought was like, my roommate is going to hate me if I don't do the dishes. I'm just making this up. Um, And I'm noticing in my body that my heart is starting to race. And what do I want to do? I want to just avoid my roommate and not talk to her, which is right. Like you said, like the probably usually we go to like the, the thing that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. If you're able to catch it when your anxiety is at like a five instead of a 10, it's going to be easier for you to slow down, think this through, 
look at like, what are the, you know, is this a problem that's in my control that I can solve? Is there another way of thinking about this that's less catastrophic? Is there a behavior that's probably more productive? So I think the first step is really to kind of teach yourself. And sometimes, like I said, you need the help of a therapist to learn these skills to not get down the rabbit hole as often. But if you're down the rabbit hole and you're in this feeling of like, oh my gosh, I can't stop thinking about this. It's just going through my head and I'm starting to panic. Um, what I want to make clear is that none of that stuff is going to harm you. It's going to go away and you can tolerate it. It's just, like I said, it's the same fight or flight system that's going off if there was real danger, if you were in the mountains and there was a bear coming towards you. So that the panic itself, attack itself is just going to run its course. It's just that you don't need that energy to fight or flee a bear. So instead, you have all these physical symptoms going on that you don't really need, and it creates these temporary and unpleasant kind of physical sensations that will go away. And same with the thoughts. So they aren't going to last forever. They're not going to make you lose control. And I think if you just take a moment, and I'm, I'm saying you, but I don't mean you. I mean yeah, people of course. in general. Um, if people kind of take a moment to just catch themselves and notice this is what's going on. And instead of trying to push it away, because those reactive strategies you're talking about, like the drinking or calling the person I shouldn't call, that's usually in a reaction to get rid of the feeling. Mm -hmm. But instead, if you tell yourself, these are feelings that are uncomfortable, but I can get through them um, and almost kind of like lean into them a little bit. Or if, if leaning into them isn't helping, then something as simple as trying to shift your attention to some kind of pleasurable or distracting activity for the moment, doing kind of like a breathing technique, um, anything to kind of shift your attention away is going to be more helpful so that you can sort of let it, let it go, tolerate it, let it kind of run its course. And then you can come back to the problem when you're a little bit calmer and can really kind of reevaluate it and decide what a more um, adaptive or helpful behavior might be. Not always easy, though. No, it's easier said than done. And that's why a lot of times people who really are getting stuck in these patterns a lot do need some help because um, it takes a lot of like structure and practice to do this. I know I can't be the only one, but I find myself in situations and I'm like, again, here I go again i already know i do this mm -hmm. but it's 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 like unconscious my and i don't even i on i honestly don't always even have the thought i get the feeling mm -hmm. so i feel like i'm already in that and then i'm like oh my god ah i'm i'm done and then i get mad i get mad at myself that I'm keep reliving this when I know it doesn't serve me. And I'm like, okay, I know I'm aware. Uh, you know, when you have that thought and then it, it almost can turn into depression because you feel like, God, like I'm here again. Okay. If we allow ourselves to have that feeling, like you're saying, is that ultimately going to move us through that pattern, those thoughts faster if we just feel it and move through it? Uh, so that part, like moving through it, will at least allow you to learn that you don't need to immediately do something to get rid of it. That you can tolerate that feeling. It's harmless. It's just uncomfortable. It's not going to do anything bad to you and that you can get through it. Okay. But as far as like the thoughts part, which I know you said, like sometimes it's a lot of times there is a thought up there. It's just that these are habits. So when you say, I just go straight to the feeling, many people say, I just go straight to the feeling because these are kind of automatic thoughts that happen lightning quick. There are habits that we go to them. In these cases, it's like, I always think that something bad is going to happen when I'm in this situation or when I feel this body sensation or when I have this thought or image or memory, it's not always like a very clear thought that comes before that feeling. But there's something there that it's so habitual that we don't even know it's there sometimes. And so I think um, when people are able to give themselves experiences that challenge those beliefs, that is the best way that they can get this new learning so that they can start to change their beliefs. So, um, for example, like 
if some, I'm just going to use like a very clear cut example. Like if someone, uh, let's go back to our, our fear of public speaking, right? If somebody is, you know, they're not going to say, I think through all these things when I'm in the presentation, they are just going to say, I go up there and I feel fear. Right. But there's probably some belief in there that like, I'm going to totally blow this. Everyone's going to laugh at me. I don't know what I'm doing. They're going to think I'm stupid. And there's kind of a couple things we can do. One is that you can really take a look at those thoughts and learn new ways of thinking more realistically so it doesn't get to that point. But what I think is a more kind of potent and powerful and quicker way to do it is to just face your fears. So if you believe that if I get up here and give a speech, everyone's going to laugh at me, then you have to muster all the courage within yourself to go give that speech so that you can test it out. It's just a hypothesis. It's just your, it's your negative guess. That's a habit. You have this habit of a negative guess. And if you keep avoiding the speech, you're going to keep thinking that's true. But if you give mm -hmm. the speech and nobody laughs at you, then you're going to start gathering information that challenges those beliefs. Mm -hmm. And when you start to do that more and more in different contexts, you start to think, oh, maybe I actually can give a speech and people aren't going to laugh at me and they don't think I'm stupid. And then you're going to feel less anxious in the first place when you go up there. So it kind of depends on, so that would be like a longer term goal or a longer term way of dealing with the underlying problem. Mm -hmm. But as far mm -hmm. as like what you feel when you're feeling the fear, like how do you cope in that moment? I think just like allowing yourself to remember that you can get through this and it's, it's temporary and it's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of noticing it without judgment. And I think that's okay. the part you just kind of spoke to, which is like, then I, then, you know, people might feel depressed because they're kind of beating themselves up over like, why does this keep happening? Well, it keeps happening because these are kind of the, this is what your learning experience has been that like, if I'm in situation X, why bad thing is going to happen. And, you know, we have to create opportunities to get new learning. Um, it's, it's not your fault. Like it's not anyone's fault. And so when you start to judge yourself for the feelings you're having, or, or when people start to be angry with themselves for having negative emotions, um, it's not helpful. It's just going to fuel mm -hmm. more negative emotions. Um, and then that can get into a whole other rabbit hole, right? Of like, what's wrong with me? And that's never helpful. What are tools in therapy if somebody has seen a therapist that are really beneficial that you use as solutions to move through this? Yeah. So I think, and you mean for anxiety specifically? Anxiety, PTSD, this is all an umbrella, right? You said yeah. like rumative thoughts, like intrusive thoughts, yes. right? Um, what could be beneficial if one is seeking a therapist to so I would recommend that people look for someone who specializes in um, an evidence-based behavioral treatment. And so what I mean by that is either cognitive behavioral therapy or what we call these third wave or like newer behavioral therapies that take more of an approach of like mindfulness and acceptance. Um, I mostly practice in cognitive behavioral therapy. And what we're trying to do is kind of what I've been describing. So helping people um, understand the nature of their own anxiety so it's not so scary, learning how to um, think more realistically or more accurately in situations that make them anxious. But most importantly, I think our best tool is what we call exposure therapy. Um, and that is having um, a person gradually face their fears. And that might be of a situation, like the one I just gave you an example of, so like public speaking, it might be fears of one's own bodily sensations of anxiety. So someone might fear their own panic attacks and start avoiding thing, places where they think they might have a panic attack, um, where escape might be difficult. Um, so we would actually do exposure to the body sensations themselves. Something like PTSD, um, exposure is usually to the memory of the trauma where we have them kind of reimagine it. Um, and then we also have them do exposure to the situations that they might be avoiding because they're worried um, that they might kind of, you know, have uh, upsetting memories of the trauma come up where they might get distressed by reminders of the trauma. Um, with things like uh, generalized anxiety disorder, um, 
Those are those worries that I told you about. Sometimes we'll have them kind of imagine their worst case worry scenario. So if it's like there's so much worry at work, maybe we're going to have them just imagine getting fired by their boss so that they can just kind of learn that like, this is just a worry. This is, I don't need to give it so much power. It's just a thought of something that may or may not happen, but I can tolerate it. Um, and just having the thought doesn't have to be really distressing. Um, with obsessive compulsive disorder, we might have them kind of um, bring on some of the obsessive thoughts that they're having and then not let them engage in these kind of repetitive behaviors, the compulsion. So for example, someone with OCD who um, has fears of contamination, we might have them like touching dirty objects and then not washing their hands or something like that. Even right now? Well, that's a great question. I mean, we're certainly not going to have them like go to the grocery store and like touch all of the surfaces. Um, but in places that are like objectively safe that we can and mm -hmm. kind of regulate. Um, so, yeah. So the idea is that the overarching principle there is to help people move towards these things instead of avoiding them. So that they can learn that the thing they're afraid of happening, that thought that's driving the anxiety that we talked about that might be kind of happening lightning quick, the fear either isn't going to happen, um, so the bad thing isn't going to happen, or if it does happen, it's not going to be this catastrophe that I've built up in my head. Um, and so when people start to get that new learning, then they can really start to see reductions in their anxiety and an improvement in their quality of life. Then also cure being a hypochondriac? Yeah, it's a similar process. So, yeah. um, with, with hypochondriasis or we call it health anxiety now, um, there's a lot of similarities to that with generalized anxiety disorder where someone might be like people with generalized anxiety disorder are worried about like common daily problems like, like work, school, relationships. And some of them have worries about health. And a lot of times what happens with those kinds of um, problems is people engage in what we call safety behaviors. These are things that might make them feel better in the short term, like Googling their symptoms or um, calling their doctor every time they feel something or checking in with their loved one. Like, do you think I'm sick? Do you think I'm okay? And these things might make them feel better in that moment to get the reassurance they need, but they actually keep their, the anxiety going and, and maintain it and fuel it more and more because again, they're preventing themselves from seeing that they don't need to do those things to keep themselves safe. They're safe anyway. And so in a way, it's like their version of avoidance behaviors. Instead of just like avoiding driving on the freeway if I'm afraid I might crash, this is um, like if I feel anxious and I feel this symptom, I'm going to engage in this behavior um, where instead of just like allowing myself to kind of feel this and like think more realistically about it. Do you see a lot of people who have fear of flying? I'm one and I am convinced if I feel a turbulence, you can't tell me I'm not going to die. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like planes going down. I'm looking around at everyone. Are you like making sure everyone realizes this is serious? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the I can't breathe. I stop breathing. I I never used to be like that. I'm like, do I need hypnosis? Like how I keep flying because I'm not going to let that stop me. But it, it's really uncomfortable. Would I just practice everything you're just saying? Just keep doing it. And then logically talk myself out of it when it's happening. Like, what are the yeah, odds? This someone is going with a fear down. of flying, we would first of all, I think, you know, it, the first thing would be to make sure that they're flying. Usually, when people come to me, they haven't been on a plane in years. So, the fact that you're um, <laughs> getting on the plane is a good first step. Um, so, usually, we would start there, just getting them to go to an airport and like look around. But if you're on the flight, so for anyone who's up on in the air and they're feeling anxious. Um, again, I would say like the more that you're doing of like, like clutching the seat and looking around, <laughs> you're basically sending a message straight to your brain that something bad's going to happen, right? You're saying like, there's yeah. danger. otherwise, why would I be doing this? And so instead I would almost kind of like do the opposite action, which is just like lounge in your chair, relax. I mean, if you really felt like you needed um, a little bit of a coping skill, you could do some like slow diaphragmatic breathing. Um, if you really needed to kind of like temporarily distract yourself, you 
could try mm-hmm, to read mm-hmm. a book or something like that. Um, but ultimately it would be about frequent plane flights with just letting it be and letting yourself feel how you feel. And what will mm-hmm. it, it would be kind of like going over this hump, right? Like the first couple of flights you would probably your anxiety would get a little bit higher, but over time it would start to get lower. Okay. So just keep doing it. Yeah, man. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your expertise on anxiety, PTSD, intrusive thoughts, and all the solutions that we can be practicing to move forward and not stay stuck and say, this is who I am and this is who I always will be because that's so disempowering. Thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. That's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. Please let me know what you think. Leave a comment, share, and we'll be back next week with a new episode.